Hi there, today I'm going to be discussing a model of counseling and interaction called motivational interviewing. It's really a way of trying to elicit behavior change talk and actual behavior change. So let's just take an overview here of the roots of motivational interviewing and how it got started. Motivational interviewing is the work of William Miller and Stephen Rolnick working together. They actually met at a conference in Australia many years ago and started talking about some of the work they'd been doing and realized they had a lot of the same areas of focus and areas of interest. One of the things was that they looked at substance use disorder treatment programs and came to the conclusion that most programs weren't really focused on the client's needs. Instead, they were focused more on the agency's needs and the agency's goals first. So their approach instead tries to focus on what's best for the client and really is a client-centered approach, very much like the work of Carl Rogers. So that's a major influence on the model. They also take principles though from brief therapy, which says that a lot of important work can be done in a short amount of time. And there's also a theory called self-regulation, or you could say thermostat theory as a way to kind of remember it, that we all have this internal thermometer or temperature gauge that tells us when things are out of order or you know too extreme to one side or the other. And that's what pushes us to change. So we all have our own kind of internal sense of that. So motivational interviewing really wants to work with our own internal drives and our own internal sense of whether something is off. Now, a few definitions that we should be very clear about. The actual term motivational interviewing refers to a client-centered directive method for enhancing intrinsic motivation. So that's a lot to unpack. But like we mentioned before, the client-centered approach, similar to Rogerian therapy or person-centered therapy, focuses on putting the client's needs first and emphasizing that the client is largely in control of the interactions. However, whereas Rogerian therapy is less directive and actually a little bit more passive in its approach and really lets the client do all the leading, this has the counselor in more of a position of control and being more directive, pushing the conversation toward change talk. And really the uh, purpose through motivational interviewing is to bring about that change talk and discover and enhance the client's own reasons for change. It's not an external pressure model and it's not telling somebody what they should do or giving them advice. It's trying to play with their own reasons and their own motivations. At the end of that part there, it talks about exploring and resolving ambivalence. So ambivalence means feeling two ways or feeling uncertain about something. So the assumption in motivational interviewing is that a lot of people aren't 100% ready to jump into the change process. They might need somebody to help talk them through and work with them as they explore what change might look like. So some key words to remember there are that it's client-centered, but it's also directive. We're focusing on intrinsic motivation, the internal reasons that each person has to want to change. And we understand that ambivalence is part of the package, that that's a big part of counseling and any kind of social service work is that people aren't immediately ready to jump into change a lot of times and being ambivalent is perfectly okay. So at the end there, we do counsel with the client in mind, but we also have a goal in mind. We're focusing on change talk. We're focusing on getting through the stages of change as well, which we'll talk about in a few minutes here. We look at that ambivalence or internal conflict the client might be having as a great jumping off point to move in the direction of change and help clients commit and make a decision about what they want to do. So the spirit and goals of this approach are that we openly address the ambivalence or uncertainty. We're always collaborating, working with the client side by side. We're trying to draw out change talk and really emphasize it when we hear change talk. We also promote the client's autonomy, meaning that clients are going to make their own decisions and that's perfectly fine. Uh, we are not responsible for what clients decide to do and we wanna support clients in their decisions and let them know that they, they have that autonomy and the responsibility that comes with decisions. It's generally a very positive-minded and optimistic approach to working with people. So let's talk about a few of the things people might want to change. 
So drug use, including alcohol and other drugs of abuse, would certainly be a significant one. People often look at smoking as something they try to change, often many times throughout their lives. Possibly gambling, sexual, sexually compulsive behaviors could be a significant area to work on. Diet, trying to lose weight, maybe trying to increase or start exercising. Those could also be major behaviors people look at, as well as compulsive shopping and spending. So these might all be things that, depending on the type of career and field you go into, you have clients who are trying to work on some of these different behaviors, and maybe you yourself have struggled with or tried to change one or more of the behaviors on that list, or you know somebody who has. What is it that gets people to change? Why do they change at all? Why do any of us decide that we want to change and actually go through the process? So thinking about it from a client and counselor perspective, if we just tell somebody to change, does that do the trick? Now, typically you would think, no, that doesn't. One kind of exception to that rule is physicians or doctors, when they encourage their patients to change a behavior, that has a significant impact and actually leads to a lot of behavior change. Not 100% of the time, but a fairly significant amount of the time. So something about being a medical expert, having some authority, letting somebody know that they have some kind of major health problem or could have health problems can actually increase someone's motivation and desire to change. So that kind of goes along with that second one because uh, you identify maybe there's a health problem or physical change that you're experiencing and you really need to make some kind of change in order to avoid that. Threats and consequences. Sometimes external pressure can get us into the process. Ultimately, motivational interviewing is gonna focus on internal reasons for change, but especially in substance abuse treatment and some of the other areas that you may be working in, a lot of clients are going to come to you with the threat of legal consequences hanging over their head with a kind of court mandate to be in your program. Does treatment itself help? For some people, it certainly does. Having that professional support can make a big difference. I also know that there's people who believe in the theory that as we get older and we become more mature emotionally and socially, that we often just leave behind some of our old unhealthy behaviors. How about the idea that uh, clients or individuals believe they can change? This goes along with Albert Bandura's social learning theory. And one of the key concepts in that is self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is something like self-confidence or our belief in our ability to change. So whether we think we can do it or we think we can't, we're probably right in either case. Now, if clients come to us and they have low self-efficacy, they don't feel confident in their abilities, but we have some of that faith and some of that belief for them, that can also play a significant role. So if clients can tell we don't really believe in them and we don't really support them, that's gonna have a negative impact on their actual outcome. So it's important that sometimes even if our clients are struggling, we still have faith and that belief in them. So why is it so difficult to change? Why is it so hard to go through this process? Well, all of you probably know change can be very uncomfortable to go through. It can even be scary to engage in that process. What's it gonna look like if I stop smoking? What's it going to be like if I give up this behavior? It's sometimes hard to imagine life without gambling or without compulsive shopping. It can also be painful to an extent. If you're going through withdrawal from a drug of abuse, if you're giving up a group of friends that you used to engage in a certain behavior with, that can be a really difficult thing. So we have to understand and appreciate when we're working with clients that change is never an easy process. In the middle of the screen there, you see this notion that clients are very used to playing a kind of game with us. And that game is called, why don't you, yeah, but. And we all do this at certain times in our lives. So the game of why don't you, yeah, but goes something like this. A client maybe is talking to you individually or even in a group setting and mentions something about, let's say wanting to quit smoking, for example. Then what often happens is you as the helping professional or the other group members around that person come up with all these, all these great ideas for how the person could quit smoking. And so you say something like, well, why don't you try using the nicotine patch? Or why don't you try using medication? 
Why don't you start exercising more? And on and on and on. So you can make up this whole list of uh, why don't you's. And for each one of those, the client will come back with a yeah, but statement. Yeah, I would take the medication, but I'm not a good candidate for it. Or I have really bad side effects because, you know, I know the medication gives you uh, bad dreams. Or yeah, I would do the patch, but I'm afraid that uh, if, I, if I get too much nicotine in my system, it won't be healthy for me from using the patch. Or yeah, I would exercise more, but I have a knee problem, so I can't really do that. So there's this endless list of excuses to go along with all the kind of positive suggestions that were given to the person. So what motivational interviewing does is rather than try to answer every single possible objection, we just avoid that game altogether. And we look at what are the client's own reasons for wanting to change. And once we determine that motivation, then we can start putting together a plan for how the actual change will happen. So just throwing out advice and throwing out ideas might not be harmful, but usually it's not very helpful. And we kind of go in that cycle over and over again. Now the role of the counselor in the whole change process is hugely important. So Miller and Rolnick, the two that we're talking about here who helped develop motivational interviewing, they look at the client counselor relationship as a critical factor in the change process. And their research actually suggests that it's the best predictor of whether clients are going to stay in treatment and whether they're going to have a successful outcome. So your relationship with your client, that rapport, that building of empathy that we've talked about, that's the most critical thing that you can have. More important than your education, what school you went to, your own personal background, what kind of theory or model you're using. The biggest and most important thing is, can you build a true, genuine relationship with your client? Therapeutic communication skills, in the end, are going to be the most important tool you have in the work that you do. So you want to practice those and take those with you everywhere you go. Now, speaking of therapeutic communication, we'll talk about a few of the key skills that go into therapeutic communication. So one thing you can do are general leads where you say, go on and tell me more about that. It's a basic tool, but it's a way of helping the client continue to draw out information from them and letting them talk. Another core skill is reflection, which you will use all the time in good counseling, where you are feeding back to the client what you're hearing them say. Even offering yourself to be there for the client in the immediate here and now using the skill of immediacy, but also over the long term saying, I'll be with you during this change process. Um, whatever it is you're trying to work on, I'll be part of that with you. Acknowledging the client, acknowledging things that they might be struggling with, acknowledge what they're thinking and feeling and uh, identifying when you do see changes. Another important tool is reframing. So similar to reflection, but with a twist and helping the client see things from a new perspective. Affirming, which is a supporting kind of therapeutic interaction. Using summary and also using open-ended questions, which we'll talk more about in just a minute. So open-ended questions. These are the opposite of closed-ended questions, which are just things like information when were you born? Where do you live? Are you married? Where do you work? Things that the client doesn't really have to think about just can give a one or two word answer to satisfy the question. And a lot of the assessment process and when we're trying to get clarification on, on certain details, a lot of times we'll use those closed ended questions just to get basic information. On the other hand, open ended questions require much deeper and more thoughtful answers. They usually can't be answered very quickly and with just one or two words. Um, they allow the client to respond with a longer and deeper response. On the topic of questions, just one thing to note here is that you want to try to avoid asking more than three questions in a row. So it's perfectly fine to ask questions of clients to gather information. We do it all the time, but we want to be careful not to turn it into uh, a feeling where the client's defensive because we're constantly asking question after question. That can often happen in an assessment session when we're trying to get a lot of information. So the nice thing about an open-ended question is that it allows the client to do some more of the talking and take things in their own direction. 
And often we can then use our other therapeutic skills like reframing and reflection and summary before getting back to our next question. On the flip side of those therapeutic communication skills are non-therapeutic communication skills. And this actually comes from a Fundamentals of Nursing Handbook. So things like giving reassurance, which is um, a kind of patronizing way of telling somebody everything's gonna be fine, that tends to be non-therapeutic. Giving approval or disapproval, meaning we're agreeing or disagreeing with what the client's going to do. We're basically saying, yes, that's the right thing or no, that's not the right thing. That tends to be judgmental and it's along the lines of advice giving. So remember, counseling, therapy, human services work is not advice giving, it's not telling people what to do, it's also not agreeing with their decisions or disagreeing. Clients have autonomy, they're able to make their own decisions and it's our role to support them in that and to believe that they have the ability to make those good healthy decisions for themselves. We're just helping draw that out and helping walk with them through that process. So we don't give advice, we don't tell people what they should or shouldn't do. We also don't wanna pry. Um, so sometimes during the assessment, uh, there's personal information can be revealed. If a client doesn't want to go too deeply into something that happened in their life, we don't pry and try to get too many details about that. And what it tends to do is make the client feel very uncomfortable and it's, Again, not therapeutic, doesn't help build a relationship. We also never try to interpret what a client's saying, um, try to guess what it means or assume that they've had some kind of experience based on what they're saying. If we're ever unsure, we wanna clarify or use reflection to make sure we understand without assuming. Here's a nice way to understand the principles of motivational interviewing with these four steps, which spell out the word REDS, R-E-D-S. So number one is we roll with resistance. So resistance in substance abuse treatment used to be thought of as a client just not cooperating, not doing what he or she is supposed to do. Motivational interviewing views resistance as a product of the interaction between the client and the counselor. So we're actually part of creating that resistance. So if we're pushing too much, the client's naturally going to push back. And when we sense that pushback, it's okay. We can roll with it and we can keep moving on. Number two, we express empathy. So we always let the client know we're, we care about them. We're listening to them. They may do things that we don't condone. They may have done things that we don't agree with or that we don't like, but that doesn't mean we can't have a conversation and build empathy with them. Number three, we develop discrepancy. So yes, we're client-centered. Yes, we're listening to the client and we're building a relationship with them. At the same time, one of the most important things we need to do is point out where there's differences between the client's actions and the client's words, and that's called discrepancy. You, in the, if you read Jacqueline Small's Becoming Naturally Therapeutic, she talks about a skill called confrontation. This is confrontation, highlighting the discrepancy between uh, maybe what a client has said before and what they're saying now, if there's a difference, or what a client says they uh, have done, a client's actions versus the client's words. So when there's a difference there, we highlight that and that's confrontation or building discrepancy. Finally, number four, we support self-efficacy. So we empower the client to make the changes. We help build their confidence, even when they sometimes don't feel confident. So now let's transition a little bit into a model called stages of change, which works very well. You'll see how it overlays really nicely with motivational interviewing. Stages of change is broken up into these five different stages or steps, starting with number one, pre-contemplation. So the stages of change are dealing with the change process, and it's a good way of understanding where somebody's at in terms of making a change in their life. So with pre-contemplation, somebody has no thoughts of changing, they're not interested in change, they may not see their behavior as a problem, or even if they do identify it as problematic, they have absolutely no plans of, of making changes. So this person's not thinking about it at all. Number two, contemplation is at least considering change and you may actually make some small steps toward that change. In number three, which is called preparation, you're actually developing a plan to make the change in the very near future, usually within a couple of weeks. In the next stage called action, we're actually doing the plan and committing to that change process. 
And finally, in the fifth stage, maintenance, we have consistently demonstrated a behavior change over a period of time. So let's break down each of these stages a little bit further. Starting with the pre-contemplation phase, you could think of this as the client or the person saying, I don't see it. I really don't see a need to change. I don't see it as a problem right now. This is the entry point to the whole process. Right here, the person just doesn't see a need to change, doesn't recognize it as a problem. The therapeutic tasks that we're going to be engaging in here include providing information and feedback. We're trying to raise their awareness that maybe it is a problem. What would change possibly look like? Just start to plant some seeds here, maybe raise some doubt about this person's level of certainty about where they're at and increase their perception of things being risky and problematic. So somebody who maybe has had some minor consequences related to their drinking behavior, but has no plans to change it. You may just be pointing out that, well, if you continue to drink and drive, you're likely to lose your driver's license or you're likely to get into an accident. You can also provide very factual information. So if somebody um, does a survey, drinking survey, for example, and it comes back on the survey that they drink more than the, the majority of people, you can share that data and information. Again, just trying to raise some awareness. The next stage is called contemplation. And contemplation, you can think of as the person saying, I do, but I don't. So you're seesawing between feeling two ways. This is really where ambivalence is the most striking. So you're seesawing between considering reasons to change, but also feeling that pull of not wanting to change or wanting to stay in the old behavior. The therapeutic task that we're doing in this stage is really trying to tip the balance in favor of change. We're trying to evoke the client's own reasons to change. We're not telling somebody why they should change. We're not threatening them with consequences if they continue the behavior. We're trying to evoke their own reasons of change and also looking at what are the risks if you don't change? What would that look like? Um, we're hoping to, at this point, strengthen the client's belief that change is possible so that they do move into the next stage. And that next stage is called preparation. This is where the client's saying, I'm ready. I actually want to formulate a plan and I want to commit to some kind of change. And you're trying to work with the person to help them determine the best course of action. And this is really where you're developing an actual treatment plan, coming up with a strategy that is acceptable, accessible, and effective for the person to work at. Preparation is generally a short stage. So you could be in contemplation for months or even years where you're considering something but not committing to it. Preparation, you're going to take maybe a few days or a few weeks at most before moving into action. Although it is possible that as the person's moving toward action, they actually slip back into contemplation and decide that they're not ready. So once we've determined a good plan of action and come up with a strategy that's going to work for somebody, we actually put it into place and that's called the action stage. This is where it's actually happening. Here the person is engaging in those specific actions that we have in a treatment plan and that we've decided on together. We're trying to produce changes in the problem areas and we're helping the client implement that plan, work through any struggles they're having and reinforce their reasons for change. Once the action has become habitual and it's more ingrained and it's lasted a longer period of time, we can call that maintenance. This is where it's really a habit. So this is where we've avoided the problem behavior for months or years. The challenge now is to sustain that change and prevent relapse because over time it does become more and more challenging to continue the same level of engagement that we first do early in the change process. So we often have to make some changes to our routines in order to stay active in this process. So we're trying to help the client uh, use strategies so they don't relapse and support the ongoing change process. Now there's one more stage here that was not actually in the wheel that we looked at, but I think it's an important concept to understand in relation to the stages of change, and that's relapse and recycle. So this is where we actually experience a slip and we return to problem behavior. For a lot of people, it is a normal occurrence as they're seeking change to a long-standing pattern. 
The task here is to help the client move back through those stages of change without becoming stuck, without becoming bogged down because of the relapse, but to actually use it as a learning experience and get back through to change um, the preparation and planning stage so they can re-engage in healthy action. So let's spend just another minute talking about relapse. So a simple definition that's a good working definition is that relapse is a return to old behavior. It's always a process. It's not just a single moment or a single instance. It's something that happens over a period of time and there's usually many actions and many things that lead up to returning to old behavior. As some examples William Miller has given, approximately 90% of alcoholics who stop drinking will actually go back to having a drink within four years. In terms of dieting, that's probably the most relapsing behavior that we have because almost all dieters eventually slip. And there are a lot of smokers as well who even after having quit for a long period of time will just have one or two cigarettes on certain occasions. So we understand relapse in the context of a behavior change process. When you're thinking of the stages of change, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, it can be more or less change on a continuum. So how does motivational interviewing tie into the stages of change? It's a very practical way of understanding your client as being in one of these stages. So if you have that model in your mind when you're working with somebody and listening to them talk about where they're at, you can understand whether they're in pre-contemplation, whether they're in contemplation, maybe they're in action, but it gives you a sense along that scale of where somebody's at and what they need to focus on. It helps you meet them where they're at better. Your sessions, whether they're individual or group, can then be tailored to help the client move toward the next stage. And keep in mind to get somebody from pre-contemplation where they're not considering any kind of change into contemplation where they're at least weighing that change would be an enormous leap for somebody to go through. So just understanding that uh, gives you a nice context in order to work with the client. So when you're developing treatment plans, you're thinking about those therapeutic tasks that are gonna help them move from one stage to the next, and the actions can be specific to that stage. All right, thank you for watching and listening. I hope this was helpful in terms of giving you an overview of what motivational interviewing is all about and how you can use it with your clients.